Hello and welcome to the Black Ponder. I'm your host, Neil Trotter, and today we're going to be talking about some foundational political philosophy. That's right. Uh, we're going to be talking about Jean-Jacques Rousseau's The Social Contract. And when I say foundational, uh, that's exactly what I mean. You know, this text was first published in 1762, but in the year 2018, we still see strong implementation of this theory, whether people realize it or not, in current governance or politics, specifically in the Western world. But, you know, Western politics, Western style governance is tr trickling down to the East. You know, one of India is now a democracy. Japan, even China has its differences in governance, but you know, you still got your premier, your prime minister, your president, and your legislation still in China, and they do things a little differently, but you can still see a lot of the theoretical concepts that are in the social contract being implemented in many countries around the world. Now, when I first read the social contract, I wasn't really feeling it. A lot of ideas were being thrown out, and I felt that it was a lot of assuming. Rousseau's throwing out these ideas. This is what should happen. This is how things ought to be. And I'm thinking to myself, well, if things fall according to what you're thinking or how they should happen, yeah, sure, maybe this system could work. But you're making a lot of assumptions and a lot of people might not fall within your framework. I think that's the first thing people encounter when you when they read the social contract or where a lot of the controversy comes from because a lot of assumptions are being, being made about of how politics should be implemented, how best governance should be carried out and people might not fall in line according to what he's talking about. But then I realized, oh wait a minute, this, this, is, this is a theory. <laughs> this is a political theory. So that's what a theory is, is an educated set of assumptions, right? And this may or may not be the most perfect way to govern a society or the best way to govern a society, but Rousseau thinks so and that he's going to defend it. And that's what this text is, is a, you know, it's a defense of a political theory. And that's important to realize. It's important to realize when you read philosophical texts, like these are people, philosophers who are really they have these theories is these philosophical ideas and they're really defending them hardcore but that doesn't necessarily mean they're right or correct they're up to disagreement to discussion to counter examples they're definitely open to that hence why the book is published right or because the book the book is published you have a right to read it and say oh no no i disagree with that and that's okay you know don't be deceived, you know, just because you have a nice fancy picture on the front cover and a nice book and there's a lot of text that's complex, uh, you can still disagree with what's being said. This is just a, a theory, a, a very a very established political theory. Um, what's important to understand, though, is that a lot of what Rousseau is saying is still carried out to this day, <laughs> right? A lot of our current politics still abide by a lot of the theory that's going on in the social contract. And that's what I want to talk about. Whether it's right or wrong, um, you can't deny its influence and its major impact on politics today. So first things first, what is the social contract? Well, let me start off with a quote. This is from Book 1, Chapter 6, titled The Social Pact. How to find a form of association which will defend the person and goods of each member with the collective force of all and under which each individual, while uniting himself with the others, obeys no one but himself and remains as free as before. This is the fundamental problem to which the social contract holds the solution. So this is the problem that political philosophy is trying to solve, or you know, a political theory is trying to solve. So you have everybody's individual wants and needs and desires, an individual will, which is what Rousseau refers to it as. And then you have the general will. This is what Rousseau calls this, this concept. General will, will is just the will of the state. Like what's best for the entire state, whole country. In Rousseau's theory, 
citizens might have their individual wants and desires and needs that they feel is best for them, but they might not realize that what they feel is best for them goes against what's best for the state. Now, a lot of people would argue that, well, a lot of times what's best for the state is not what's best for every individual person. It's best for some people, but it's not best for others, <laughs> right? And this is, this is what I would argue. In many cases, that's, that's true. But in the social contract, Rousseau argues that, no, what's going on is that there is this general overall what's best for a state and what's best for a state is what's best for everybody. And when individuals argue about, well, the state's doing one thing, but I want to do something else and I'm going to fight for my right to do this. What's happening is it's a confusion with that individual. The individual is confused. He doesn't understand. He or she doesn't understand that you're actually hurting yourself by going against the general will, the general state, the good of the general state. This is what Rousseau would argue. Now, again, this is to the assumption that the, the state is carrying out a will that is best for all people, which oftentimes is not the case. But I think Rousseau would argue like, well, if a state is doing something that goes against its individuals, that doesn't fit the needs of its individuals, then it, its general will is corrupt or it has really no general will. And that state itself is a failure. So there's a lot of theory going on here. So let me continue, let me continue. Each one of us puts into the community his person and all his powers under the supreme direction of the general will. And as a body, we incorporate every member as an indivisible part of the whole. So that's what the social contract is. Each individual of the state, the, the citizen, contributes to the good of the state, the general will. And the social contract is the recognition that your individual will, what you desire, what you want, what you think is best for you, needs to be in alignment with what's best for the state. That's the so social contract that the individual, the citizen makes with the state. Okay, as a citizen, I'm going to do what's best for the state. I'm gonna contribute my will, my individual will to the state for the greater good of the state. So we're gonna shake, on hand, shake our hands. <laughs> Me and you, you know, I'm, a, I'm an American, so I'm shaking my hands with America. Okay, Lady Liberty, let's shake on this. You do what's best for me, I do what's best for you. We develop a social contract, yes. <laughs> And again, this is all theoretical. This is what should be taking place. And if that social contract is not uh, abided by, is not followed through, then the state fails. Now let's go deeper into this idea, this concept where we Rousseau starts explaining what actually is a government. I now turn to book three, chapter one of government in general. Listen to this quote. Every free action has two causes, which concur to produce it. One moral, the will which determines the act, the other physical, the strength which ex executes it. Okay, very important concept to understand as we delve into this theory, this political theory. So there's two components to a free action. Okay, two components. The will that decides upon the act, right? I want to do this because okay that's one component this is why I'm doing this what I'm doing okay the morality the ethics behind it and then there's the other part which is the physical part now you might want to do something but you might not be strong enough to do it well I believe this person shouldn't die because it's wrong but I, I can't do anything about it because I'm too weak and the person that's going to kill a person is too strong therefore no action could be taken. Likewise, you might be a generic strong man that's doing all these things that require a lot of power, but you have no reasoning behind what you're doing, so you're not really freely acting. Maybe you're just following somebody's orders. For free action to take place, you need both that moral aspect and that physical aspect. You need the moral capacity to do what you want to do, and you want the physical aspect, the strength to be able to do what you want to do. The body politic has the same two motive powers, and we can make the same distinction between will and strength. The former is legislative power and the latter executive power. Nothing can be 
or should be done in the body politic without the concurrence of both. So Rousseau abstracts politics or governance. He makes it into a body. <laughs> like he, he personifies governance to make us to make it easier to understand what it actually is. And he calls that the body politic. And for a government to do a free action, for a state to act freely, in it's, it, it does it needs those two individual aspects that moral aspect the will to determine to act that's legislature and the strength to carry out that action well that's executive power in america we have those two branches of government the legislature which is the u.s senate and the house of representatives and we have the executive branch which is the president of the united states and his or her cabinet many forms of government throughout the world have those two branches of government, a legislative branch and an executive branch. See why this is foundational? And that executive branch is the strength to carry out the will of the people, theoretically. What then is the government? An intermediary body established between the subjects and the sovereign for their mutual communication a body charged with the execution of the laws and the maintenance of freedom, both civil and political. So what is the sovereign? Right, that's another separate aspect, which is bar part of Rousseau's The Body Politic. The sovereign is a very important part of Rousseau's political philosophy, and is not unique to Rousseau's political philosophy. You see this concept in many other political philosophies of that era. Let me show you uh, Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. This, look at this picture right here. You know, I did this in uh, my a video of Leviathan. So you have this ruler right here, the ruler of the state. And if you look very closely, this, this picture, it, he is composed of the people. There's like people that make up the body. I don't know if you can pick that up on camera. Oh, there it is, yeah. <laughs> It's the people that make up the body of the sovereign. So we have the citizens of the state and for their will to be carried out, all the citizens join together as a state, this general will, the will of all citizens within the state, there must be some sort of sovereign, some sort of fictitious body, this designated person or entity that carries out that general will. And that's what a sovereign is. But the idea is that, that entity, that sovereign, reconciles the, all the individual wills of the people into a general will and then carries that general will out. And it uses the legislature as a tool, as an instrument to carry that general will, to implement that general, general will, to realize that general will. I therefore call government or supreme administration the le legitimate exercise of the executive power. And I call prince or magistrate the man or the body charged with that administration. So we see this concept more or less in modern political philosophy. And here's another thing that we see. Here's another quote. The sovereign can limit, modify, and resume at pleasure since the alienation of such a right would be incompatible with the nature of the social body and contrary to the purpose of the social union. So the sovereign, the person designated to carry out the general will, has complete authority over the government. Or the prince or the magistrate is what the title that Rousseau calls the government. And this government needs to be put in check because the government's purpose is to create the laws that will carry out the will of the people, the will of the state, the general will. And if the government goes beyond that scope, that capacity, then the sovereign must put the government in check. The sovereign's responsibility is to carry out the general will. The government receives from the sovereign the orders which it gives to the people. And if the state is to be well balanced, it is necessary, all things being weighed, that the product of the power of the government multiplied by itself should equal to the product or the power of the citizens who are sovereign in one sense and subjects in another. So the sovereign is a, is a theoretical 
concept, right? Because you're giving full power for the sovereign to control the government. But that sovereign needs to abide by the general will. It needs to be constantly reconciling the individual will of all the state citizens into a general will that fits the needs of all the people the best way that the state can. And it does that through the government. Now this is, we're assuming that the sovereign, this designated entity, will do that, <laughs> right? So you're giving this entity a lot of power uh, and you're making the assumption that the that this entity, this person or unit that's designated will do that, will use that power without abusing it. If the sovereign seeks to govern or if the magistrate seeks to legislate or if the subjects refuse to obey, then order gives way to chaos, power and will cease to act in concert and the state disintegrating will lapse either into despotism or into anarchy. So Rousseau acknowledges, yeah, okay, if either entity, even the government gets too powerful for its britches, it doesn't focus on creating laws that the sovereign can use to carry out the general will. If the government is doing more than that or not doing that enough, or <laughs> if the sovereign is too big for his or her britches and is not carrying out the general will but carrying out its own will or something of that nature, or not doing enough, then the state falls apart and then you no longer have a state so you gotta understand this is this is this is a theory right so for every for it to all work out there needs to be this balance between the individual will the citizen and the general will the state the the sovereign the government and the citizen the social contract needs to be perfectly abided by for this political philosophy to work now that's asking for a lot now listen to this this is another challenge that we see a lot in modern politics while the subject remains always one single individual we're talking about the sovereign the ratio of the sovereign to the subject increases according to the number of citizens once it follows that the more the state is enlarged the more freedom is diminished when I say that the ratio increases, I mean that it is farther removed from unity. So what happens is the bigger the state, the more citizens, the less of a percentage they have contributing to the general will, their individual will contribute smaller to the general will. Kind of like stocks in a business. Like if a business has uh, 10,000 stocks and you buy one, then you only have a 10,000th of a stake in that business. So if the business fails, eh, not that big of a deal. But if you bought like a thousand, <laughs> then you have a lot bigger stake in the company and you might be a little bit more concerned. Hence what Rousseau is trying to get at is the bigger the state, the more challenging it is for a single individual to be invested in the state because its individual will is smaller compared to the general will. The smaller the relationship between the particular wills and the general will, that is, between the people's morals and the law, the more repressive force will have to be employed. Hence, for the government to be good, its strength must be increased to the extent that the people is more numerous. In proportion as the enlargement of the state means offering the holders of public authority more temptations and more opportunities to abuse their power, it follows that the more power the government needs to control the people, the more power the sovereign needs in its turn to control the government. So here we get to the debate of big government. Right. What happens is when a state becomes extremely large, you run into problems. The pro one of the problems you run into is that there's so many people, people start to feel like, oh, the government really doesn't have any concern for me. I'm just one person. You know, you know, my vote really doesn't matter type of concept. So the sovereign must do more to get a citizen, get a citizens involved with the general will. The sovereign must be more powerful. And then the government has to be bigger to accommodate all the laws necessary to get all those people that are part of the state involved in the, with the general will. So what happens is that as the state gets bigger, as a state has more populace, a government has to get bigger. And to keep that government in check, 
the check and balance must be more profound. And this is the challenge of political science in terms of states with big populations. When I read this, I think about the conservative argument of we need to get the government as small as possible. The government needs to do as little as possible and let its citizens do what they need to do. Have a little more say with their individual will. This debate, this conflict in ideology, this challenge has been going on for a long time. I would like to read this quote right here. It comes from chapter five of book three. It's called Aristocracy. We have here two distinct artificial persons, namely the government and the sovereign, and therefore two general wills, one belonging to all the citizens and the other two members of the administration only. Thus, although the government may regulate its interior discipline as it pleases, it can never speak to the people except in the name of the sovereign. That is, in the name of the people itself, something that must never be forgotten. So the sovereign and the government are two embodied instruments of the people. They're just theoretical constructs, really, to carry out the will of the people within a state. And, a ch and it's a challenge to make this all work out. As the government gets bigger, right, it might not care so much about its people because it just becomes an administration with its own concerns. Or the sovereign, this theoretical concept of the sovereign, starts to become its own entity or it starts to become merged with the government as an executive branch of the government or the executive aspect of the government. It becomes more the strength part of the free action of the administration. It's a balancing act, right? And to keep all these roles well defined and separate and functioning and have them functioning with the roles that they are designated to do, it's difficult, you know, especially as a, as a state gets bigger, as a country, as a nation grows in population. So this is a, a political philosophy that, you know, you see throughout the world in various variations, but you can definitely see resemblances and make comparisons and juxtapositions from various states throughout the world. And I find it interesting that, you know, you see this political theory that was first published in, what, 1762, and you still see it being hashed out today in 2018. Isn't that incredible? I, I think it's pretty good. Uh, it's pretty interesting. Now, is this the most perfect system in the world? No. Uh, it's an experiment. It's a theory. And we need to, you know, and there are many people that say we need to do away with this theory because it's just not going to happen. It's impractical and it, it just relies on too much variables. And that may be true. In any case, if you're interested in political science or political theory, you like politics or you're a historian and you study politics, I mean, this is a must read, a must read, <laughs> the social contract. Um, you're going to get a lot of information, a lot of fundamental information about how our politics works in today's world. Well, you've been watching The Black Ponderer. Tune in next time for more Philosophical Thought.